What the hell is going on? What's really going on? We said, what the hell happened? You don't have to know what the hell is on it. They, they see what's going on. I don't know what's going on. What is going on? We must find out what is going on. Hi, I'm Danielle Pletka. I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? Mark, what the hell is going on? What the hell is going on is that the British just had an election, and it was the largest conservative victory since Margaret Thatcher. They have 48 more seats than in 2017, and it was the worst labor defeat since 1935. This was a, so there was all these reports coming in. It's sort of reminiscent of 2016. All these reports coming in. The election's getting closer. It's tightening. It's tightening. It might be a hung parliament. No, there's no hung parliament. It's a absolutely overwhelming conservative victory. And of course, you know, we're being Americans. It's all about us, right? So we want to know what can we learn from the British election and the Tory victory as relates to 2016. How does this predict what could happen here? What are the lessons that we can take? Uh, You know, Boris Johnson campaigned a lot. There's a lot of analogies between Boris Johnson's campaign and Trump. He won over the blue-collar voters. He he won constituencies in Britain, labor constituencies that hadn't voted for Tories since 1950. And he did it by promising to spend colossal amounts of money on infrastructure and, and invest in the National Health Service and also Brexit. There's a lot here to go through and to understand that really could affect us here at home in the next year. That's true. Boris Johnson is no Margaret Thatcher, but <laughs> he's not. And, you know, we, we had Boris Johnson at AEI as our annual dinner speaker a couple of years ago. He received our Crystal Award. So I mean, he's got a lot of admirers here. He was absolutely mobbed by fans uh, that, mm-hmm. that evening. Um, he's got a lot of admirers among conservatives here in the United States. I don't think he is a Donald Trump. He is a far more educated, far more sophisticated, far more polished, don't look at his hair, uh, <laughs> in, individual. But I think that's an analogy, too, because so Donald Trump plays plays the Queens guy, you know, the working class guy. But he's a man. He grew up in Manhattan. His, he grew up a millionaire. But he is able to reach that blue collar base. Boris Johnson is an Eaton man who is able to win over the working class. So it's very yeah. similar. Yeah. Well, it's similar on the outside, but I think that, <laughs> I, I think their, their brains are substantially different. But I do think this has real implications. I have to correct you, Mark, as a member of the as a as a member of the Commonwealth, if I can put on my Australian hat. Crikey. Yeah? Crikey. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we, it wasn't the British election, and this is obviously going to be a bone of contention in the future for the United Kingdom. It was a UK election because the Welsh and the Northern Islands, Scotland, they all participated. And and rather differently than 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 the English participated. So this is just so we, people understand. So there is England, which is one of the four countries of the United Kingdom. So when you refer to the United Kingdom, that, that refers to England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. And then there's Britain, which refers to Britain and Wales. Is that correct? Know. So it really, I, I've got to say, and again. I hate to agree with Mark up front, but you do that a lot. These I know you're just so I'm, persuasive. You're, you're getting smarter every as since we started this podcast. You keep getting smarter. I, thanks so much, Mark. <laughs> I, I reveled in seeing Jeremy Corbyn oh, stomped, and the fact that AOC came out and endorsed him just before only made it sweeter. He is a bad man, and I don't mean leftist policies. I don't mean, you know, pro-union. I don't mean pro-national health. I don't even mean his quasi-socialist garbage. I mean... Not quasi. (laughs) Well, you're, you're right. He hates Jews. He hates Israel. And by the way, the two are separate with him. He hates Jews and he hates Israel. It's not that he hates Israel and therefore he hates Jews. He has been an anti-Semite for so long. The Simon Wiesenthal Center came out in the week before the election and said that Jeremy Corbyn was one of the greatest threats to Jewry in the world. And, you know, to say that, understanding that not because because he's about to go and kill Jews or start concentration camps, but because to have as prime minister of a country like the United Kingdom a country so important to us, a country that is, you know, a a pinnacle of democracy, to have someone like him who despises the Jewish people as much as he does is truly, would have truly been a danger to Jewish people. And so 
good bloody riddance, Jeremy Corbyn. Well, but the not good bloody riddance of the anti-Semitism of the Labour Party yet. And look, this you know, if you go, we go back to the the Charlottesville rally here in the United States, where people running and chanting "Jews will not replace us." That could have been a Labour rally. I mean, literally, and I and I don't even say that as hyperbole. There was just a uh, they, they just had a rally leading up to the campaign where they started singing some Palestinian song about how the Jews would be destroyed when somebody raised the issue. So I mean, there is anti-Semitism that is rife in the Labour Party, and I have to tell you, it's it's obviously not the same here yet. But you know, there's been a tolerance of anti-Semitism in the Democratic Party here in the United States with with Rashida Tlaib and and the Squad and. You know that that is troubling, and it's not inconceivable that you could see them going down this path here at home. Well, what I would like to see is that they get treated with exactly the same contempt that the English writer treated uh, treated Jeremy Corbyn. And the the question for the future is: Right, is Jeremy Corbyn the Labour Party, or is the Labour Party something separate from him? And I I don't think we know the answer to that question. And I think the same goes for us, uh, not just for for the Democrats and the Squad, for Ilhan Omar and all of those guys, but also for the Republican Party. You know, is the Republican Party Donald Trump? Certainly, that's what Democrats would like to suggest, is that the fact that no Republicans are voting for impeachment, they suggest, is because it has become an imperial party and he has become the emperor. So you're drawing the analogy between Trump and Corbyn. I'm drawing the analogy (laughs) between all of the challenges that we face in all of these parties, which is that the individuals are very important. And increasingly, in the kind of system that we have, they begin to personify the party. And certainly, that's been true for Corbyn. But I would say that Trump has had a lot of influence inside the Republican Party, has the squad has had a lot of influence among young people and on the left of the Democratic Party. Well, that's also the interesting thing is that both here and in the UK, the young people are leaning further and further left. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the uh, younger voters voted overwhelmingly despite the anti-Semitism, despite everything, or who knows, maybe because of it, who knows, they voted overwhelmingly for labor. It was the older voters, people our age and above, people of a certain age, to quote Danny. uh, uh, (laughs) I didn't say that. Who put Boris Johnson over the top. So, you know, it's an interesting question, is the future socialist, both here and in the UK. As these voters get older and get jobs and have families to support, you know, do they become more conservative and less enamored of socialism? Or is this sort of a have we failed to educate the next generation about the evils of socialism where in the UK you can have someone who is not just a quasi-socialist but an actual self-avowed Marxist socialist get 57% of the vote of 18 to 24 year olds. Yeah, it's just staggering. Stunning. No, I mean, look, Winston Churchill said it very nicely when he said, you know, if you're not, what, uh, I'm going to bungle this quote, but you, if, you're, if you're not a liberal when you're young, you're uh, no heartless, heart. you have no heart, and if you're not a conservative when you're older, you have no brain. I want to delve down with our guests into the analogies between what happened in the UK in this election and, and the upcoming US 2020 election, because the, you had this, uh, the way Johnson won was by breaking down what's called the Red Wall, which is the the working class constituency winning over labor voters by a margin. And, and he also, there was this cadre of voters, which the Democrats are counting on here, the suburban voters in the US. You had a lot of suburban voters who voted for Donald Trump in 2016, but switched to the Democrats and gave them their congressional majority in 2018. How did those voters uh, in the UK vote, the suburban voters vote? So I think we're going to have a, a really interesting discussion with our guest. We've got a fantastic guest, and I'm sorry, everybody, if I sound like another person. I've got this awful cold that's going around D.C. right now, which is miserable. So thank God you're only hearing me on a podcast and not in person. You Henry Olson. Here. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you should actually see me. I look like a misery. Henry Olson is joining us. Uh, Henry, like Mark, is a columnist for the Washington Post. He's a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. He is a refugee from the American Enterprise Institute, <laughs> and we, we miss him here. He's the author of the Working Class Report. Republican, Ronald Reagan, and the return of blue-collar conservatism, really somebody who I think of as a very thoughtful, very numbers-driven, fact-driven analyst. He got 2018 right. He got 2016 right. You have absolutely. You have lots of green room flattery for him, right? No, absolutely. So, I mean, I uh, first of all, I'm a, Henry is a friend from our AI days, of course. Uh, but I will tell you that on, in the 2016 election, when I was in the Fox green room, and the election results were coming in, 
everybody was sitting on their phone with their Twitter saying, Henry Olson just called this district for the Republicans. Henry Olson says this. Oh, my God. I mean, everybody was following Henry's Twitter feed as to what was happening that day. So they all wanted to know what Henry was calling and what his analysis is. So he's a brilliant guy. He's my fellow, uh, one of my handful of fellow uh, people on the island of conservatism over at the Post Opinion page. It's more of a pinhead of conservatism than it is an island. Oh, that's up. They, you know, but they, they brought Henry on because they wanted a real conservative voice. and On American why, politics. On American politics. Just the reason they brought me and Hugh Hewitt on as well. And so I love sharing the page with him, and I'm really excited that he's going to be on the podcast. So he's actually been in the UK for yes. the election. He's been so reporting for a week from London. Bird's eye view, and he's on the phone with us from London. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me on. So fill us in. I mean, we our listeners already know who won, but talk to us about what the, were the results and how did Boris Johnson pull off such a victory that was so large that it surprised a lot of people? Yeah, well, uh, he said in his victory speech that it was a great stonking mandate, and that's a nice British term for landslides. They uh, won 365 seats, the highest number of seats since the Margaret Thatcher era got almost as large of a share of vote as her in her 1979 landslide. So basically, it's the best that the conservatives done since the 1979 victory. And uh, they can pretty much run Britain the way they want to for the next five years. How did he do it? Well, he did it by running a great campaign that focused on clear, identifiable issues, get Brexit done, unify the country, and unleash Britain's potential, something that you, you could remember. But demographically, what he did was that no one has ever done, not even Margaret Thatcher. He got the working class. There's a poll out that says typically the Tory party built from the top and extended downward. They dominated among middle class and upper class people and tended to do less well. This is the only election in British history where the Tories beat labor in every single social class, including the poorest, the DE class. That's how he got it done, is by breaking through and uh, bringing working class and the working poor into the Tory party, not the Labour Party. There are going to be great analogies here to the U.S. vote that I want to ask you about later, but I have one key top-line question. Were you surprised? Actually, no. I tweeted out on the two hours before the polls closed that this stuck to me like the 1980 election, that it would be a larger victory than they were calling for, and I said minimum of 350 and perhaps over 360 seats. So... To beat the British prognosticators on this one. Everyone here was surprised, but I was not surprised. And why? Why weren't you surprised? What led you to make that prediction? People had had enough. This was a Labour Party that had, just like the Democratic Party in the 1970s, was not recognizable to the person who loved it for Franklin Roosevelt, but didn't love it for its culturally liberal stances and its weakness to the communists. It was not, the Labour Party here was not recognizable to its bedrock working class voter. And Boris Johnson, just like Ronald Reagan, was a different type of conservative. Ronald Reagan was a former Democrat who could speak Democrats' language and showed compassion and empathy. And Boris Johnson was the British version of that. And I think there are millions of people who may not love the Tories, but they thought they deserved a chance. And that's what I saw here, and that's why I wasn't surprised. Well, it sounds like he was not just a British Ronald Reagan, but a British Donald Trump in the sense that, you know, he, just to, as you pointed out, Trump won in 2016 because he broke through the Democrats' blue wall in the Midwest, and Boris Johnson won because he broke through the Labor Party's red wall. Tell us about the red wall and how he broke through it, and what are the analogies here with the United States? You know, I do think that there's a perfect analogy there with Donald Trump, that The Red Wall is a collection of working-class, decaying industrial towns that basically spread from northern Wales up northeasterly until it hits somewhere around Newcastle upon Tyne. And these are places that, even in the Thatcher era, didn't vote for the Tories. Occasionally, you'd find a seat here and there that might have gone once. But these are places that generally haven't voted Tories since the 1930s, or in some cases, never. And he broke through. He smashed through them. He won something like 40 seats in the Red Wall. And now there's no longer a Red Wall. There's a blue corridor that stretches from uh, the Irish Sea all the way up to the North Sea. And he did it by talking to what they cared about. First, Brexit. No other party had any credibility to vote Britain out of uh, the EU. And these places voted 65, 70, as much as 75% to get out of the EU. 
So that was number one. And number two, he said, I've heard you. We're going to spend public money on you. We're going to spend money on your NHS. We're going to stop immigrants from taking your jobs. We're going to spend more money on police so you don't have to worry about knife crime in your neighborhood anymore. He ran a blue-collar, what they call one-nation conservatism here. And so they heard that he was listening to their concerns, and they were willing to give him a chance. So one of the things that is interesting is that, as you say, he's not a traditional Tory. He's not sort of a a toff or a knob or a lord or a fancy guy. Uh, at least he's, he doesn't appear to be one to the general public. But he's also not a fiscal conservative. Uh, now, I think the Tories, that ship sailed for the Tories a while ago. Neither of... Uh, but either is Donald Trump. Yeah, right. And neither neither was David Cameron and neither, neither was May. I mean, but is that just over? Is Is the era of conservative fiscal policy just done? Depends what you mean by conservative fiscal policy, but this is a person and this is now a party that is going to commit to significant public spending. There's not going to be privatizations in this administration. There's not going, there might be a move to get a balanced budget by the fifth year, but this is not going to be a conservative government that counts pennies and pounds rather than spending on what the people want. So if that's your definition of fiscal conservatism, yes, it's been thrown out the door. It's been thrown out the door here, too. I mean, Donald Trump campaigned on not touching Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, and Boris Johnson campaigned on a colossal new investment in infrastructure. So did Donald Trump. I mean, you know, for for our listeners here in America, it's all about us, right? So what lessons are there from this for the United States that inform us going into the 2020 election? Well, yeah, first of all, that uh, if Donald Trump were more populist, if he had been followed through on more of his economic promises, I think he'd be in an even better position than he is, because when people are hurting, they want to see that the government cares about them. And that means they want their taxes cut, not taxes for corporations, and they want public spending on programs and things that they value and benefit from. And uh, I think if President Trump goes in with more of a fiscally liberal platform, he will have an even better chance of doing well in the blue wall states. I think what it also means is that a conservatism that here is not really a religious conservatism. And so uh, what you had was Johnson is a man of cosmopolitan London. He is somebody who is pro-immigrant, but pro the right kind of immigrant. And he's not somebody who's fighting a culture war. And that meant that he was appealing enough to suburbanites to maintain Tory votes in the South, while also being uh, not the sort of person who would culturally alienate they have more secular workers in the North. And I think a Republican that does an American version of Johnson is really what the country wants. And uh, that would be a lesson that the Trump strategist should try and listen to because the template for victory was played out on Thursday night here. You had a terrific column on the Wimbledon voters, which were the British equivalent of the Romney-Clinton voters who defected from the Republicans uh, here in the United States, defected in 2018. Uh, Over here, the polls are showing that about two-thirds of those voters are planning to come back to Trump in 2020. A New York Times-Siena poll just showed that. How did Boris Johnson do among the Wimbledon suburban voters in this election, and what do you think that portends for us uh, here in the United States? You know, what I'd say is just well enough. They did lose seats down here to those voters. With Wimbledon seat that I was in, the incumbent barely won re-election against the Liberal Democrats. Uh, They have multiple parties here. And I think if the Labor Party had not had Jeremy Corbyn, who uh, is to the left, well, AOC endorsed Jeremy Corbyn by Twitter on Election Day, he is well to the left of AOC. And that scared a number of soft suburban voters back to the Conservative Party to keep out Jeremy Corbyn because they knew that the only alternative to Johnson was Corbyn. And that's another thing that could happen is that if uh, Sanders or Warren is the nominee, they're not as scary as Corbyn, but from an American context, they're just as scary as Corbyn because they're for an American about as left wing as you can go. And I think if they, if Trump is lucky enough to have one of them as his opponent, he'll be able to run the sort of them out campaign that Johnson was able to run to keep the Wimbledon voter in line, even if they might have preferred not voting uh, Tory this time. That's exactly where I was heading for you. You know, I mean, I absolutely 
despise Jeremy Corbyn, and I think I've made that clear on on Twitter. I mean, he is an anti-Semite. He has taken the Labour Party away, not just from its roots, but frankly, away from British tradition, uh, to my mind. Uh, how important was Corbyn to Johnson's victory? And and what the hell is he going to do? Is Corbyn actually going to leave his cold, dead hands at the helm of the, the Labour Party? <laughs> well, Corbyn, in his uh, victory speech in his constituency of Islington, said that he would not stand to fight another general election. And they announced that they will try and uh, have the leadership vote uh, early next year. So he will stand down as leader. You will not have to worry about him again. However, I know a number of labor activists who despise him, a number of people who cast conservative votes for the first time in their life, even in safe seats, because they would not give their vote to a hateful man like that. And this gives them a chance to retake their party. And the question then is going to be is, was Corbyn a one-off? Or does Corbynism now represent the heart of the Labour Party? And okay, so this is this right is now. a really important question for you, Henry, because you know American voters, you know most most normal people don't spend a lot of time thinking about the structure of politics and how you know how the primaries work and why primaries force us toward the fringes in each party, for example. But this is what's happened in the UK as well, right? Which is that they opened up the Labour Party to basically to a, an almost popular vote, where it used to be a much more exclusive vote, which is how they ended up with Corbyn. Explain a little bit about that and give us what your thinking is about how that's going to matter for when they choose the next leader. Yeah, well, you know, they don't have a primary system, but what they did do was open it up so that dues-paying Labour Party voters could have the dominant say in who the next leader is. And so there's only a few hundred thousand people who actually pay the money. And so 150,000 or so lefties under the Momentum movement joined the Labour Party so that they could get their socialist Bowie day in the party. The way to beat Jeremy Corbyn is they're going to have to mobilize real voters, uh, real people to become Labour Party members to retake that party. Because if they can't, they can have a parliamentary majority. They can have a trade union movement that wants to be more centrist and actually talk to middle Britain. But under their party structure, if they don't have, you know, 100,000 or 80,000 or 120,000 people who will plunk down the dues, care enough about the future of the Labour Party to come in and say, no, we want the Corbynistas out, then you'll either have the Corbynista successor come in, or you'll have a split party because you'll have an elite party that is at odds with its dues-paying activist base, but they could maintain control of the party machinery as a result. Yeah. So, Henry, you know, as we're looking at some of the polls, the conservatives won people 65 and older by 62 percent, but labor won the 18 to 24 year olds with 57 percent of that vote, the 25 to 34 year olds with 55 percent of the vote. So as the older generation, both here in the the United States and and in uh, Britain, leaves and this new generation comes up is the future, even though this is a big victory for conservatives, is the future socialist. That is the huge $50,000 question, and uh, not just in our countries in the West, is that uh, what you find is in Australia or in Germany, the same thing, is that uh, conservative support is way down among the youth. You know, one thing I caution is that you know, youth turnout is lower than older people's turnout, and I strongly suspect that the sort of person who votes in their 40s but doesn't vote in their 20s is the sort of person who is conservatives attract, you know, the person who isn't consumed by ideological causes, didn't go to university, but once they're married and have children, they get involved in the community and they start voting. So I I, I don't want to put too much stock on those figures. But you also have the question of remain versus leave, which was heavily split on age here. And that was a major issue in this. It was basically a third referendum. I can hope for the British state that when we move into a post-Brexit era, that conservatism will have more of an appeal when people who thought that leaving would be the death of Britain that they love, they find that it's rather not. In America, one of the biggest problems with the youth vote is not the college set. It's the fact that it's the largest non-white set, and it's simply another way of measuring Republican uh, lack of strength among non-white communities. But here is a way in which I think blue-collar conservatism is the only way to deal with that, is that the vast bulk 
of young voters, by the time they reach that cohort reaches their 30s, will be working class Hispanics and Asians. And I don't see any reason why a blue collar conservatism cannot reach and motivate blue collar Hispanics and Asians in their 20s and 30s and 40s when they've settled down with the family any less than it can motivate blue-collar whites to support uh, a Republican agenda today. Well, we're going to have you back on to talk about this when the elections get closer. But just to drag us back to the U.K., so I want to ask you about two things. One is just to entertain myself. Um, (laughs) So what about Scotland? That's not how Scotland didn't vote the way the rest of Britain voted. No. No. And uh, the Scottish National Party leader, Nicola Sturgeon, was calling for a referendum on independence again. And that was one of the big questions on the BBC of what's going to happen with Scotland. It's quite clear that a majority of the Scottish people don't want to be ruled by London, but they are uneasy about independence. I think what Boris is going to do, he's staunchly against another independence referendum. I don't think he's going to permit one during his tenure here or during the first five years. But what he has to do is build support for the union. And I think what he that means is that just as he's going into Burnley and Newcastle under Lyme and Stoke and all these places that are the chips in the red wall that he has now painted blue, he's going to need to go to Glasgow, another depressed industrial town that voted completely for the Scots Nationalist Party. And he's going to say, even though you didn't vote for me, I'm going to invest in you because you are part of the one nation I love. And if he can do that, he may not want Tory seats back up there, but he can really forestall the popular drive in Scotland for independence by showing them that Westminster and London care as much about Scots as they care about England. What about uh, Northern Ireland? Uh, that's not going to come to a head as quickly, but that's going to be something that I think, whether it's Johnson or another successor, Northern Ireland is inevitably drifting uh, away from the United Kingdom. Okay, so let wait. Let, let's um, just step back a second and explain to our listeners here why these two things matter. I mean, people forget. We talk about the UK, but the UK, there's a reason it's called the UK. It's the United Kingdom, and it's may not be, it may not rule India and South Africa and Australia and Canada anymore, but the union remains very important, and it's, it's It's very, very wobbly right now, right? Oh, it's completely wobbly right now. I'm a big English soccer fan, and there was a humorous video a few years ago where the mock English coach of my team turns to assist and says, how many countries are there in this country? (laughs) Um, And that's that's what it is. There's four countries in this country. And Northern Ireland, we know about in the United States because of what's called the Troubles, which is to say the guerrilla war between Protestants and Catholics that went on for uh, almost 30 years. And by the middle of the next decade, they will, Protestants are already not a majority in Northern Ireland, and Catholics will be a clear majority by the middle of the next decade. And then the question is, do they want to remain part of the United Kingdom? And the withdrawal agreement is going to set up a different cust- – they will remain within the United Kingdom, but there will be some sort of border check in the Irish Sea so that the border between Northern Ireland and Ireland remains open. And increasingly, Northern Ireland, I think, is going to drift away from the United Kingdom, both because of the demographic changes and because of the unwillingness of the people here to really sacrifice much to maintain the union. But that's not going to be something that's going to come to a head in five years like it might in Scotland. I think George Johnson's task there is he has to do something no British prime minister has been able to do in the last century, which is to go into the Catholic communities in Northern Ireland and try and convince them that it's worth their while to stay, as opposed to long for romantic reunion with their southern brethren. And uh, if he wants to keep the union, that's what he's going to have to do. So, you know, we talked about the Red Wall, and I think for some of our listeners in America, it's confusing because here it's the the Democrats are blue and Republicans are red, but over there, the labor socialists uh, chose red as their color. I've always thought that red would be more appropriate here as well, (laughs) for uh, obvious historical reasons. But In breaking through that red wall, a lot of those voters took a gamble on Brexit and a gamble on Johnson that he's going to deliver for them and make their lives better. Now he's got to deliver. How does he do that? How does he bring back jobs? And, you know, here in the United States, you know, under Trump, 500,000 new manufacturing jobs. There's been a lot of improvement in the lives of people who who voted to break down the blue wall. How is he going to deliver for the uh, folks who uh, broke down the red wall? Well, uh, I think what he's going to do is target public infrastructure and public investment. And the United Kingdom is a centralized nation. 
you know, that when the government in Westminster decides they're going to do something, it gets done. So that means he's going to build roads up there. He's going to invest in research in universities up there. I think he's going to try and steer businesses that want to, uh, once they sign free trade agreements with the rest of the world, I think he's going to try and steer development away from London and towards the north so that prosperity begins to spread. There's no certainty that it can succeed, but there is a certainty that it won't succeed if he doesn't try. And I think he understands his speeches over the last 24 hours have made it completely clear. His future, his party's future, and if you hate Corbynism, his nation's future depends on these voters voting Tory. And that means he has to change the Tory party to serve their needs first, not the needs of the affluent London suburbs. What are the prospects for a U.S.-U.K. free trade agreement now? And how can the United States help him succeed? Wait, Henry, before you answer that, um, because I want to ask a setup question for that, actually, which is, which is, you know, Brexit. I mean, even though the English have doubled down on Brexit, you know, it's still sort of leaping off of a cliff into the unknown. So, you know, yeah. how worried do you think people should be? And then I think Mark's question, please answer Mark's question, because that sort of builds on on that. Is, you know, revitalizing the transatlantic alliance somehow going to be a, a solution? I think that you should be much less worried than the elites want to have you. I think that it is neither in Britain's nor Europe's interest to have a sudden break to the agreement, a sudden break in trade relations. I think it's in their interest to have an amicable divorce, not an acrimonious one. And so I don't think there will be a reversion to World Trade Organization or WTA rules as of the end of the withdrawal agreement in the end of 2020. I think that America can help Britain a lot by rushing to its aid with some sort of free trade agreement. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to be the full-blown takes years to negotiate agreement, but something that opens up trade in meaningful ways. And I think that's something Boris wants, and I'm 100% sure it's something Trump wants, and I think it could get done by the summer time. You know, basically, keep their, over here, Corbyn kept raising the, I believe, false specter of selling off the NHS or raising the price of prescription drugs because the evil Donald Trump wants to buy the NHS or make American drug manufacturers take more money from Britons. And that, that you just can't ask that. I don't think America will, but you just can't. And Boris Johnson would say no if the deal were dependent on that. But other aspects, yeah, I think you get a trade deal done. And there's also the Commonwealth, you know, that they uh, want to have a trade arrangement with India, well over a million Indians who live here, you know, because it used to be part of the empire, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, there's a lot of lifelines that Boris is going to be trying to draw on. And I think all of those countries will be quick to sign free trade agreements, and that will help mitigate any downside from Brexit. Exit question for you. You know, reading your dispatches from London all week as you've been over there, uh, you know, reporting and had, had fascinating columns. One of them you talked about, we should be jealous of the British system because uh, it's superior to ours in a number of ways. And you, you pointed out that there really aren't primaries or caucuses in, in uh, Britain the way there are here, that you get selected by the party, by the elites, right. uh, which means that the sort of elites are in control. And it also means that he, that Johnson now has a guaranteed vote on Brexit because you wouldn't be standing if, if you weren't supporting it. But also that, you know, that there are no political ads on TV. It's, uh, oh, my God. I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> but what that means but what that means is is Henry is that the elites are really much more in control of the political system there than they are here the the elites choose the nominees the TV presenters or the, the mainstream media as we call it here are much more influential in deciding and shaping public opinion and yet Boris Johnson seemed to succeed in having a populist revolt in one of the least populist political democratic political systems in the whole world yeah well I think that there are trade-offs. You know, we have enormous ease of access of ordinary people or ordinary extra-party movements to political influence. And so that's the good side. The bad side is everybody's raising money and everybody's currying favor and parties can't get anything done because there's no such thing as a party. It's 235 independent businessmen who happen to slap the label Democrat on their name who are uh, running the House of Representatives. So there are downsides our system while acknowledging the many good sides. But what I'd say is look at what's happened over the last few years. 
that as much as the elites didn't want Brexit, they got it. As much as the party system pushes out dissenters, because of the rise of UKIP, they had to pay attention because there was a competitor party. And ultimately, what it meant was a determined effort of the popular will was able to break through all of those barriers and to do something that if you put truth serum, you know, I'm sitting here in the city of London right now, the financial capital. You know, if I walk down the street to all these bankers who I'll be running into at dinner tonight and said, did you vote Remain? What do you think about the EU? They probably all tell me that it's a terrible idea, but they're going to have it because that's what the British people want. So it took longer than it might have taken in America. But even here, democracy works. That's a great note to end on, Henry. Thank you so much for uh, for spending time with us. It's great to talk to you. Really, this was awesome. It's great to talk to both of you. Yep, and, safe uh, travels home. Looking forward to coming back to uh, the ungrateful colonies. <laughs> we'll be waiting we're, for we're, you. We're looking forward to it. Take, Take care. Take care. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Henry Olson didn't disappoint. He's a really good political analyst, and uh, I thought that was just terrific. Yeah, no, listen, I mean, for all of those who were panicking about a month ago about the need for another referendum or, you know, the British system failing or, God forbid, Jeremy Corbyn, this is really, he, Henry was right. I mean, Henry was right. He quoted Boris Johnson. The Labour Party got a stumping. And so, I mean, I can't say all, all's well that ends well because I think there still are difficult days ahead. I think that, you know, Brexit is not going to be as simple as some people hope it will be. And... I do wonder, there were a lot of rumbles inside Europe about Brexit. You know, when the vote happened, we all thought, yeah, maybe, you know, Italy, Greece, even France. There are countries that could go the same way. This could lead to the breakup of the European Brexit, they talked about. Right, exactly. Exactly. And then, of course, it all became such an unbelievable Charlie Foxtrot that nobody, nobody wanted to go down that road. I wonder whether this will revive talk about uh, talk about changing the EU. Well, now it sounds like, you know, it's going to be fairly smooth. Part of the problem was that you had a prime minister who really didn't believe in Brexit. Theresa May was against Brexit when it was uh, uh, being done, but then promised to implement it and couldn't bring herself to do it. Boris Johnson came in and said, we're leaving Brexit hell or high water. I can't remember what the exact phrase he was, but they said, we're leaving with a deal or without a deal. It's happening. And he, t- he brought that sort of Trumpian, you know, I'm going to get it done and uh, to hell with the elites, to hell with Europe, where we're going to do it. And he he broke through. And and, uh, and actually, the interesting thing is that the European leaders are actually celebrating his victory now because they finally have clarity. They finally have, OK, this is happening. We now got a, a mandate from the British people to do this. We've got an agreement. It should go fairly smoothly now. What's what's interesting is what will happen after Brexit and well, how it affects the British economy and those workers, those working class voters that wor- voted for Boris Johnson. Uh, will he be able to deliver for them? Well, that's the $64,000 question for him. And will it lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom? Which, I mean, yep, that's some, pretty serious, some yep. pretty serious internal problems. Well, maybe if Joe Biden is our president, he can <laughs> recommend the breakup of the United Kingdom into three separate countries. Uh, since like he did Iraq. In Iraq, he recommended the same thing for Afghanistan. So, you know, he's a guy with one idea, but at least he's consistent. So, you know, I don't think you have happen. to worry about that, Danny. <laughs> You don't think so, That's huh? a topic for another podcast. But, it is. You know, this presages a lot for the United States election coming up. So, you know, the fact is that those blue, the our blue wall, their red wall voters are coming home to Donald Trump right now. The polls show that two-thirds of the people who defected in the 2018 election are coming back, are going to vote for Trump. He's gotten a lot of things done in the last week. Um, in the last week, yes. Yeah. But, he's got, but he's got 54 more weeks or 52 more weeks to screw them back up again, Mark. Well, it'll be interesting because these, so the moderate Democrats here need to deliver some victories and work with Trump in order to hold their seats because they're in Trump constituencies. They're in Trump uh, districts. And so now all of a sudden you've got the USMCA coming through and you've got a uh, defense bill that, that has passed. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets some progress on infrastructure next year. But, you know, there's analogies here. There's the blue collar voters. Johnson was able to win back enough of the suburban voters to prevail in the election. Will Donald Trump be able to win back those suburban voters in those suburban districts and hold on to the presidency? So there's a lot of parallels here. And if I was Donald Trump, I'd be looking at this saying it uh, it bodes well for me. Boris Johnson is a much more disciplined individual. 
who does not have the predilection for corruption that Donald Trump does and is capable of staying on message much more than Donald Trump is. So I'm not sure how much this presages the next election. Well, I think. Well, you know, Donald Trump won in 2016 when everybody, people like you were saying, making that same and you, analysis. And you. Making that same anal- uh, analysis. And, well, I've been humbled by my failure to call Donald Trump's election, where some of us have not. <laughs> But, of course, humility is not a word we use with Danny Veroff. (laughs) (laughs) A lot is going to depend in the United States on who the Democrats choose. You cannot doubt that that Corbyn helped Boris Johnson. Yep. So, you know, if we end up with the American Corbyn, I have no doubt. And as I have said, if we do, if we end up with Bernie or Elizabeth Warren, you heard it here. I'll vote for Donald Trump. I think most of America will vote for Donald Trump, and I think the Democrats are starting to realize that, which is why Elizabeth Warren is uh, is slipping. He's tanking the in the polls. Well, that is a topic for another day. Anyway, this has been great. Thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for having us. And our team here at AEI is Alexa Santry, Matt Winesett, Jen Moretta, and Macy Heath. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI dot org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D. Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.